Welcome, Peter Kellner. You are the president of YouGov. I am, yes, YouGov. We started in Britain um, 13 years ago. We're uh, one of Europe's first online market research and polling companies. We built up in a number of countries, including here in Sweden. We built up large panels of people representing the whole range of society, young and old, rich and poor, north and south, men and women. Um, and uh, as a result, we've produced some pretty accurate uh, polls, including here in Sweden at the last Swedish election, when we got it right to within a fraction of a percentage point for each party. Extremely interesting. And you, are, you just presented a very uh, interesting study on trends, mm. what you see in Europe regarding the views on social democracy? Uh, that's right. Um, social democracy in the last 50 or 60 years has been a pretty popular force in a number of European countries. And yet today, when we have the world economy in such trouble, we had the problems in 2008, the banking collapse and so on, globalization, uh, you'd think capitaliz capitalism would be unpopular and social democracy would be uh, rising in support. And yet you look across Europe and social democracy is, is really quite low down. So here in Sweden, the Social Democrats unusually have lost two elections in a row. In Britain, the, the, the Labour government was thrown out three years ago with one of the worst shares of the vote that Labour's ever had. Uh, in Germany, at the last elections, the Social Democrats had their record worst result. In France, although we do have a socialist uh, uh, president in Francois Hollande, he is now, a year on into his presidency, the least popular president France has ever had. So all we set out to is ask the question, why is social democracy, when it ought to be doing so well, doing so badly? And the fundamental reason, I believe, and what our YouGov poll figures across these four countries show, is there's a, a crisis of the state, which is every bit as deep and perhaps more long-lasting mm -hmm. than the crisis of capitalism. 40, 50 years ago, people were quite prepared to see a reasonably high taxes in return for high social protection, pensions, benefits if you're unemployed, universal health care, universal uh, education. But now as these things have all become more expensive, people live longer, medical treatments become more expensive, people have to stay longer at school and, 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 and college, the taxes have had to go up to pay for these things and people are now resisting these high taxation. So the fundamental appeal of social democracy, which was so high half a century ago, is no longer as high as it was. So, so how is the value change regard seeing as, as the state of, of caring of people? I think one of the most interesting things we found in this uh, study is that um, people still want uh, in an ideal society, a state that does things, it, health care and education, pensions and so on. And indeed here in Sweden, that progressive idealism is probably higher than almost anywhere else in Europe. But there's a big gulf between the progressive ideal, what people think society really should be like, and what they think is now happening. Because across all our countries, including here in Sweden, People don't think that the tax system is fair. They don't think the government is spending its money efficiently. So it's not that the dream of social democracy has gone. Mm. It's just that people are becoming more um, disenchanted with the practice of government involvement. And that's the problem that has to be solved. Mm. So how do you see the development of the social democracy based on the report's results? I think social democracy over the next five, ten, twenty years has got to do two fundamental things. The first, it's got to, it's got a big, if you like, intellectual task, working out how you deliver these, the things that people want when they're not prepared to pay extra taxes. And that be, means being a lot smarter about the way you deliver pensions, healthcare, education, and, and, and so on. It probably means more decentralization. It means finding additional ways, not just paying for them through taxes, but uh, in Britain, for example, students now uh, used to get through all their university education for free, now they have to pay for it. Um, I, I think we have to find a wider variety of, of mechanisms for paying for these things. But um, secondly, I think that um, the old contest between left and right
mm. it is now over. Let me explain what I mean. For the last 50 years, 80 years in Sweden, <laughs> it has been the compassion of the left versus the competence of the right. And as long as the left had a big lead on compassion and was not too far behind the right on competence, the left could win. Mm. Today, people don't believe the left is n as compassionate or as caring as it used to be. And if it's not got as big a lead over the right on compassion, it really needs to be up there and fighting and leveling or even beating the right on competence. So that's the second big lesson I would learn. Apart from the intellectual needs to redesign the state, the left has to um, have a much better reputation for economic competence than it has needed for perhaps the last 50 years. Mm. Extremely interesting. I thank you so much for coming here, but before letting you go, what's your view on Almedalen as the point of meeting? If you'd asked me 12 hours ago, I'd have said it is perfect. <laughs> Today, this morning, it's raining. Yeah. It's, it's much more <laughs> like me being at home back, <laughs> back in prison. <laughs> but as an event, it, it is just wonderful. I like the range of people, of events. It's a fabulous location. This, this, this small, old, walled city. So everything is, is within walking distance. Um, and you meet all kinds of people. It's very relaxed and informal. And it's also, what I love about it, is that you have people from different political views. And they're happy to be civil to each other, to share their ideas, to talk seriously and respectfully. And I think that's something special about Sweden. In Britain, I would love to see something like this, but I don't think you would get the, the same courtesy, the same tolerance along the range of political views. But here it's special. Yeah, D any special meeting yesterday mm. that you had time to do with something unexpected or so? Um, well, I tell you what, I came and watched the Prime Minister in his big open speech. Now I don't speak Swedish, yeah. so people were telling me broadly what he said. But what I but you could tell he was an accomplished and confident performer, speaking for what forty minutes without notes, um, uh, uh, and this informal open air setting. What would have been five thousand people? I would guess something like that, uh, having a good time listening. A little bit of um, heckling at the very beginning from the far right, but that was all. You in Britain. If you tried a big open access, open air meeting with a big party leader, I tell you, you'd hardly get the leader heard for all the um, heckling from the mm. people who come to oppose them, which is why in Britain, you very seldom get party leaders as were in, in open access outside forums. They tend to be in inside in halls with heavy security. Mm. So watching something like this happening, it's a real celebration of, of a confident, open, tolerant democracy, which does immense credit to this country. Mm. Wonderful to hear your experience. Mm. Have yeah. a safe trip home and thank, thank you for you very coming. Much. I've enjoyed it. Thank you.